Hi YouTube. So I watched a little video by Atikana recently, laughed wholeheartedly at it, and then posted a comment to that effect. Atikana replied and suggested I post a video response. So here it is. Now just before we get started, I want to issue a warning to my viewers. Atikana is an amazingly boring individual. Uh, he has the charismatic appeal of a middle-aged balding man of meager stature who still lives in his mother's attic. Hence the name. Look, look, here's what I mean. One of the key doctrines in modern evolutionary theory is that of genetic common human ancestors, male and female, the so-called Y-chromosomal Adam and mitochondrial Eve. Ah, sorry, must have dozed off there for a bit. Like I said, amazingly boring. Anyway, with it being April Fool's Day and all, I thought, you know, we'll have some fun with him first. But enough of the cheap shots, let's see what he has to say. According to scientists, a common genetic thread links these two particular individuals to the whole of subsequent humankind. The first female common ancestor is alleged to have lived many thousands of years before the first male common ancestor. Wrong! It's not the first common ancestor, it's the last common ancestor. Now this may seem like a pedantic point, but it's a huge difference and it shows you have very little understanding of the material you're dealing with. But your point that these maternal and paternal ancestors are separated by several thousand of years is uh, correct. All human females alive on the planet today can uh, trace their genetic ancestry back to one individual female that lived about 200,000 years ago. All human males can do exactly the same thing, but to a male living about 75,000 years ago. This discrepancy in time might look like a problem, but it's not when you think about it. These last common ancestors don't by any means represent the first ever humans. And they certainly weren't alone. It simply means that their genetic lines, and only their genetic lines, successfully continued to this day. The fact that the last male common ancestor is so much younger simply means that all other male genetic lines preceding Y chromosomal Adam have since died out. This Y chromosomal Adam might have been a particularly fertile tribal leader who fathered many offspring, or simply a cautious individual whose dumb luck meant that he didn't get killed off so easily. Either way, his specific lineage survived where all others failed. In this way, I rather suspect, certain atheist scientists are seeking to attack the book of Genesis by undermining the idea of a first man and a first woman living together. What? Science doesn't set up to disprove religion, that's just a happy coincidence. Look, and it completely misses the point. Whether you like it or not, mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam are indeed fact. And if that doesn't match what you think your magic book says, well I'm sorry, but that doesn't change reality. But if this is indeed the idea, then it fails completely on grounds of basic logic. The first female common ancestor had to have had a human mother and the first male common ancestor had to have had a human father. It's not the idea, and you are the one who is failing completely. And as I said before, it's the last common ancestor, not the first. And as to your ridiculous chicken and egg argument, this just shows you know nothing about evolution. Let me ask you this. Where did Chihuahua puppies come from? That's right, Chihuahua mothers. And where do they come from? Right, more Chihuahuas. But if you trace the lineage of Chihuahuas back far enough, you eventually get to wolves. And it's a completely smooth transition from wolf to domestic dog to chihuahua. And at some point along that line, you can say that the first chihuahua was born to a domestic dog mother. And no amount of genetic nitpicking can alter the fact that their mothers and fathers were our ancestors as well. Of course, but this is where your ignorance truly shines, because we are talking about the last common ancestor, which are the most recent ones, and not anything earlier. Therefore, the concept of a first man and a first woman, whatever their personal genomes might have consisted of, still stands. And it follows from this that genetic science in no way undermines the book of Genesis. No, it follows from this that you in no way understand what you are talking about. And besides, it is permissible to exercise a certain skepticism as to how reliable our understanding of the genetic past of humanity really is. Well, it's blatantly obvious that your understanding is incredibly limited. 
But skepticism is the whole idea of science. It's open to critical inquiry. In fact, it's not just open to it, it, it requires it. That's the whole idea of the scientific method. All new theories are rigorously tested and scrutinized. That's how science works. Just look at how scientists behaved in the case of Mongo Man, a Homo sapiens fossil found in Australia. His DNA was extracted and analysed, but it turned out not to fit in with the current understanding of what human DNA for this period should have been like. So it was simply disregarded by evolutionary scientists who cited posthumous modification as their excuse for doing so. Wrong. The DNA from Mungo Man was indeed extracted and analysed, and yes, it did initially contradict the current theories of human migration. So what did the scientists do? Did they just simply disregard it? No, not at all. The results didn't match the hypothesis, so both were re-examined. The original hypothesis was already supported by plenty of evidence and looked pretty stable, so the results were re-examined by a whole host of independent scientists. In fact, I'm just going to uh, quote directly from the link that you sent me. To solve the long-standing debate, Professor Bowler amassed a multidisciplinary team of experts from the Universities of Melbourne, Adelaide, Wollongong, the Australian National University, CSIRO, and the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service, and used multiple methods and four separate dating laboratories to achieve a final consensus. So no, the results weren't simply disregarded, they were thoroughly re-examined. And guess what? They were found to match and support the current migration theories. Now remember, this is from a link that you sent me. I'm not entirely sure you're firing all cylinders here, mate. It's kind of like trying to prove Bigfoot exists by showing everyone your monkey suit. If Mongo Man's DNA had fitted the pattern required by current evolutionary theory, then would scientists have had anything to say about posthumous modification? Is it not rather more likely that they would have accepted such evidence without further ado? Well, Mungo Man's DNA does match evolutionary theory. The scientists initially made a mistake, but due to a rigorous review, the mistake was corrected. But to address your question, if the evidence had matched the theory straight away, would it have been subjected to the same scrutiny? Well, probably not, but it still would have had to pass the peer review process, and the data would still be there for people to scrutinise for themselves. It is not to be wondered at, though, that evolutionary scientists invest so much in the DNA argument concerning human origins, because it provides a convenient substitute for fossil evidence, which in the case of our species, Homo sapiens, is remarkably scanty. Look, fossilization is an extremely rare event, so it shouldn't really be much of a surprise if there aren't so many Homo sapien fossils. But I'm just wondering here, where exactly do you think they get their genetic evidence from? That's right, fossils. It's not a convenient substitute, the two support and rely on each other. All the more remarkable, if the meagre evidence of Homo sapiens in the ancient fossil record is compared with the plentiful fossil evidence concerning Neanderthal man. I'm not entirely sure where you got this idea from, but keep in mind that Neanderthal man had a history that's about twice as long as Homo sapiens. So yeah, they're going to have more fossils. If Homo sapiens did indeed emerge some 200,000 years ago, then then in the thousands of subsequent generations, even before their supposed departure from Africa, there must have been millions of them. But their fossil remains seem puzzlingly reluctant to be found. Really? Are you sure about that? Because I couldn't find anything that supports what you're saying. Now keeping in mind that fossilization is an extremely rare event and that geologically speaking 200,000 years isn't really all that long, there are still plenty of uh, modern human fossils out there. And even if there are less than expected, couldn't that possibly have something to do with the lifestyle or burial practices of these Homo sapiens? Finally, it should be asked as to how much DNA really, really reveals anyway. Scientists are very fond of telling us about how similar our DNA is to that of the chimpanzees. And yet the differences between how we live and how the chimpanzees live are very profound indeed. Well, no, they're not really. Look, look at it this way. Uh, the DNA between you and a mushroom is very different, and subsequently you live very different lives. One is pale, unappealing, and lives in dark, dank environments, while the other makes for a great pizza topping. My point is, if you're going to make a comparison like this, you need to look at the broader picture. 
Of all the organisms on Earth, which are more similar to humans, biologically and culturally? Chimps. And of all the organisms on Earth, which are most genetically similar? Chimps. Almost all of our biological functions are completely identical. We both form hierarchical social groups, we both use tools, and we both show complex emotions. The only major difference between us and chimps is we have complex language, and that allows us to convey complex ideas. This has led to an explosion in cultural differences, but at the heart of it, we are still 99% chimp. Yes, there are similarities, but there are huge differences also. Which suggests to me, and perhaps to others as well, that there are distinct limits as to how much the science of genetics has to tell us concerning what it really means to be human. Oh, but that's just it. The science of genetics doesn't study what it means to be human. It studies genetics. Anyway, thanks for watching. Happy April Fool's Day, Adekana. And as always, keep learning.